that just hurts the heart. I can kind of relate. I make fun, but that's the truth. Uh, well, one student said something that really kind of got me. One student said, I lost my sister. I'm like, oh, that's not good. I was supposed to be watching my sister. She got away from me. We lost her. We found her, but I was scared. Like, yeah, that stinks. Uh, my my situation is actually similar. The thing that I lost that was probably the most painful for me, that caused me the most amount of heartache while I was looking, was my son. Uh, my two-year-old, I call him the blonde tornado. Uh, his name is Levi. He is a crazy little person. I love him to death, but he is nuts. He's a lot of fun. We lost him uh, about maybe two months ago in this very building. We, uh, we were in the youth room, which is the big building or the big room just across the hall. That's where I spend most Sunday mornings. Uh, and service was over. Uh, my wife Tiffany went and got him out, out of Kids Rock and brought him over. And she kind of like brought him in and looked at me and I looked at her. And I think she thought I was watching him and I thought she was watching him. That's like 90% of the time how parents lose their kids is one parent thinks the other parent's watching them and back and forth. So I'm standing right outside the, uh, the student rock room, kind of saying hello to people or goodbye, service is over and stuff. Then I look around and I don't see Levi. So then I look at my wife and she looks at me and she looks around. She doesn't see Levi. Like, do you have Levi? No, do you? No? Ah, uh, crap. Okay. So then you immediately do the usual thing you do, which is like the, the, the quick look around. Like that. Okay, he's not in this visual range right here. Now we've got to start searching more places. So we start doing that, and we're running around, and then all of a sudden, because at first it's not, it's not real scary. It's like, he's a toddler. We lose him for a couple seconds at a time, a few hundred times a day. It's like, where is he? Oh, there he is. You know, it happens all the time. So at first it's not a big deal. Then all of a sudden you check all the areas you think you should be. And then panic sets in. And it's like, I, um, I don't know where else to look. This isn't good. Then all of a sudden, you, you get that feeling inside. You're like, um, I, I'm scared now. So immediately, I run outside in the parking lot to make sure he didn't get out in the parking lot. Because if he did, that would be dangerous, of course. My wife starts checking all the rooms around here looking for him. Uh, we start asking all the people who know who he is. Hey, have you seen my son? Have you seen Levi? You know where he's at? And all of a sudden, that heart-wrenching feeling of just like your heart's like sinking down into your stomach sets in. You're like, oh my God, please help me find my son. What is going on here? Then all of a sudden, he comes walking out of the sound booth in the youth room. <laughs> he's fine. He found some candy back there, and he was eating it quietly so no one would find him on purpose because he's clever like that. Now, the sound booth back there is much like the sound booth in here. It's got a wall about this high, which when high schoolers or adults walk back there, you can see them. When a blonde tornado walks back there, you cannot see him. So now we always check the sound booth first. But there's one other time when I lost Levi. It's a shorter story. Um, when we lived in, um, it sounds like I'm a bad parent. Here's all the times I lost my child. No, uh, it's only happened twice, I promise. <laughs> we're better at it now. When we were living in Arizona, uh, it was at night, which is why it was scarier. And we're at our house, which is like a good thing. But uh, it was dark out, and I had been in and out of the house um, checking. I was building some stuff. I was doing some woodworking. And so I was in the garage in the front yard, and that's all connected to the backyard. And Levi had just figured out how to use doors, and we didn't know that. Uh, he couldn't always open them and turn them, but he could open and shut them if, if, if the latch wasn't latched. And so he's inside, but uh, I think the back door was open so he could walk out in the backyard, but he couldn't go any further than that. And it was kind of confusing. And all of a sudden, we just realized, man, I haven't seen Levi for a little bit. So we start looking around the house. Same thing, get wrenching feeling sets in, can't find him, and it's dark out. And in the city we lived in, there were no street lights. So right outside our house, pitch black, totally dark. And it's Arizona, it's a desert. So first thing I do, of course, is I run and I, I grab a flashlight right away, because if I'm looking outside for him, I need to have a light so I can see where he's at. Uh, Tiffany's looking in the house. I'm looking outside desperately with the flashlight, going crazy, calling for him. Finally, he's in one of the rooms in our house that we usually keep the door shut. It was like an extra spare room. He had, that door had propped open, so he went inside and shut the door behind him. So that door is always shut, so we assume there's no way he could have gotten in there because we didn't know he could use doors yet. It was nuts. But the key for me is that gut-wrenching feeling of when you're looking for something with a sense of desperation. And you would kill to, 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 to light it up, to be able to see more clearly. I love to use a flashlight when I'm looking for something. I'll use a flashlight even if it's not that dark. Even if it's, you know, it's kind of dim, like in daylight, of course, that's weird. But when it's kind of dim and kind of dark, I will use a flashlight. It helps you focus on what area you're looking at. Because when you just scan, you really don't do a very good job of looking very well. But when you have a flashlight out, you focus on one pinpoint area you can make sure you're looking at one at a time. Now, I want to relate this to people who are searching for something because... I think everyone would probably agree that everyone's looking for something. There's songs written about it. I forget, it's uh, Sweet Dreams or whatever it's called. Uh, some song is everybody's looking for something. I think that's true. Every person on this earth is searching for something. And it may sound like a cliche, but I think, I think they're all looking for Jesus. I think some people know it. I think some people know that they are missing God in their life, and they know Jesus is the way to get to him, and they are looking for Jesus. 
I think other people don't know it. I think some people don't know what they're looking for, but they know they're looking. They know they were born or they're into this world with, with a hole in, in their soul, and they're looking to fill it with something. And some people fill it with things that are unhealthy. Some people look for ways to fill this void we have in our heart with things that they shouldn't try to fill it with. Some people try to fill it with, with, I mean, some of the ugly things. Some people try to fill it with religion, which I'll tell you right now is a mistake. Religion will not fill that void. Only Jesus will. Try to fill it with all sorts of stuff. And these people are all searching, searching for Jesus. The Bible quite literally tells us it's our job to help them find him. There's a couple of verses I want to look at real quick. The first one is John 8, 12. It should be on the screen. I'll light it up in here a little bit. It says, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Now go ahead and leave that verse up there for me for just, just a minute. I, I love this verse, and I think there's a little more to it if you pick it apart a little bit. See, of course, Jesus is the light. He is how we get to heaven. He is the light of life. When he's talking about life, he doesn't mean us living here on earth. He's talking about eternal life, that we can be in heaven because he died for our sins. But there's a couple of things... That, also in this verse I want to look at that are huge for me. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have light of life. Go back up. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me. Now, if, you, if you're looking this up in your Bible, if you can see it all, highlight the word follows. Or if you're taking notes, write that word down next to John 8, 12, and, and highlight it when you get back home and, and open your Bible up. Because this, this doesn't say that whoever believes in me has my light. This doesn't say whoever believes that I existed. This doesn't say whoever reads about me in the Bible. It says whoever follows me. I think that's a, that's a huge key point, that we, we can bear, we, we can have a light like Jesus. We can have the same light he had, and it can shine before men. But it doesn't happen just because we want it to. It doesn't happen just because we believe he existed. It happens because we follow him. You know what the word Christian literally means? There's two literal definitions for Christian. One is, um, is little Christ, like a miniature Christ, or Christ follower. They mean basically the same thing. Unfortunately, the word Christian is it can become... Uh, almost overused, I don't want to say cliche, but it's a hard word to use nowadays. Some people even have negative connotations when you use the word. But if you take it to its literal meaning, if we are Christians because we follow Christ, then this ought to be true. And we should never walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That's the other word I want to focus on, have. We are not necessarily the light. We got it from Christ. But we can have it in ourselves as well because we follow his teachings and follow what he said. And that's huge. We're going to hit on that a little more in a second. But let me go to one more verse to make this clear. This is Matthew 5, 14 through 16. It says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I love this verse. This is one of those verses you can pretty much live by, especially the, the last little bit there. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I love that. This makes the call so very clear. The people should see us as Christians, Christ followers. We follow the way of Jesus. They should see us, a light in us that should shine before them that's so bright and so amazing that they should see that and want to know more about it. They should see that and want to know more about what is this faith you have? Why, why, why are you different? Why do you have this light about you? Not a literal freaky light, but like the way you act, your good deeds, your, your morals, the way you treat people should be different. Now, if you were to ask most people right now, hey, are Christians different? You'd get some pretty ugly answers. The most common word that comes to mind is judgmental, which makes me very, very sad. But unfortunately, that's, that's what makes the news, right? Is when Christians mess up or do something bad, that's when you hear more about it. You don't hear a whole lot about the good stuff that Christians do, unfortunately. And some people have negative opinions of Christians for those reasons. I wish instead they would have this kind of opinion of us. In my life, only once that I can remember that I live a life where I had a light inside of me that someone saw it and wanted to know more about it, that I had a chance to share my faith simply because of how I was treating people. Now, I, I don't always get it right, not by a long shot. I was listening to Art's message from last week again, and he said something profound towards the end. He said that he wishes he could live his life like he preaches. I'm with him on that, man. I, I don't always get this right at all. Sometimes my light is dim and dull and, and kind of lame. Other times, uh, it's not so bad. But one time in my life in particular, I can remember where a good friend of mine named Richard wanted to know about my faith simply because of the kind of life I was living. It's kind of a weird story, but stick with me here. 
This is my uh, senior year in high school. I became a believer my freshman year, so I've been a believer for about three years. I've been going to a youth group back in California, and the youth pastor there had challenged us, uh, all the guys that he talked to. He said, um, I want you guys to be a light before men. He showed us these verses. Here's some of the ways you can do that. We brainstormed some of the ways we thought of we can do that was to uh, get our language right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Most high school guys don't have very good language, if you know what I mean. Um, and so get your language right, treat people with respect, be polite, say please and thank you. When you have snacks, offer them to other people. Real simple stuff that a lot of high schoolers, frankly, lack. And that will make you be different and see if people will notice. Live a slightly different lifestyle and see how that goes. So I, I've been trying to work on that. I've been trying to live a life that was a little bit different from those around me because my youth pastor challenged me to do so. And I was with a group of guys. We, we were geeks. Okay, we were computer nerds. Now, geeks become the new cool today. I wish that was the case when I was in high school, uh, but not so much. So we're computer nerds. We play tons of computer games. And what we would do for fun is we would have a LAN party, L-A-N. Some of you might know what that means. It's kind of dead today. Now you have Xbox Live. You don't need to do this anymore. But a LAN party is when a bunch of geeks get together, get their computers together, usually in somebody's garage, hook them all up together, and just play video games all together on the same network for like 24 hours straight. It was a ton of fun, absolute blast. I loved going to these things. I wish I could find these things nowadays. They're hard to find. But uh, me and a bunch of guys from high school would do this maybe once a month, and it was a lot of fun, a whole lot of fun. But these guys weren't believers, and, uh, and their language was rough. It's hard for me to reflect the way they talked because we're standing in a church, and it's, I can't say a lot of the words they said. Um, but just, this is the weird part, just regular, normal ways of talking, not, not even when they get angry. If one guy would get up to get a soda, the other guy would be like, hey, get me one too, female dog. And the guy's getting a soda, no, F you, racial slur. And just for no reason, they just like use these profound uh, languages at one another. And they, they're friends. They like each other. They're just naturally rude and mean because they're insecure. I don't know, I guess. And what's funny is every time I tell this story, every single high school boy laughs hysterically and pokes the guy next to him. Because it's true, they still do it today. Nothing's changed. High school boys just naturally berate each other with, with insults. And the worst kind of insults they could possibly think of all the time. And this goes on every time I'd hang out with these guys. I didn't really mind a whole lot. I knew they were, you know, they're okay guys. They were friends. Um, but this is how they talked. But my youth pastor challenged me to, to talk a little bit differently, to be a little bit different. So I, mean, I would get up, hey man, can I get your soda? Yeah, F you, yeah, Okay. <laughs> they didn't really know how to respond to that because they're not used to people actually asking them if they would like them to get something for them or be nice. I would offer them if I had snacks. Would you like some? Uh, okay, take the whole thing, take some, give it back. You know, they're weird. They're kind of weird about it. They don't know how to handle it. Um, when we play games, most of the time we're you know, playing computer games against one another. Uh, if they'd win, they would rub it in. If they would lose, it was my mouse's fault, my mouse broke, or something, make up an excuse. And, and they would just be mean to each other. After games, I would try to say, hey man, good game. Or uh, nerd talk, GG stands for good game. I would try to say that after every game. And most guys didn't care. Yeah, Nick's a Christian. He's different, whatever. But one guy there named Richard, really neat guy, good friend of mine, he took notice. Richard, uh, he's Laotian and grew up in a very traditional Asian home. And his parents would be very upset with him if he were to use that kind of language or to treat people like most other guys would treat them. Um, so he was a little more polite. He was a little bit nicer. And most of the time he was just quieter because other guys, if he was polite too much, they'd kind of make fun of him and whatnot. But for some reason, the way I was treating people at the time stuck out to him quite a bit. And so one night, uh, online, of course, because we're nerds, I do this to signify online, we're typing, this is my typing motion. Um, all of a sudden, he instant messages me uh, after we'd had a LAN party. We probably slept a good 18 hours afterwards because we're all dead, but like the next day, he had like, an instant message me, hey man, what's up? I'm like, nothing, what's going on? He's like, can I ask you a question? I'm like, yeah, shoot. And he says, why are you different? Uh, what, what do you mean? Like, I have a different haircut? I don't know. Um, and he goes, no, like, when we hang out at land parties and stuff, you don't, you don't seem to get upset like the other guys do. Like, when they lose at a game, they get mad. And you tend to offer any food you have to other people. The other guys don't do that. Why, why are you different? And all of a sudden, like, these light bulbs ring off my head. Oh, my gosh, my youth pastor was right. It worked. I'm kind of freaking out a little bit. Like, okay, carefully type back the right response. Like, you know, being real careful about it. And I was like, hey, man, this may sound kind of hokey and kind of weird, but... Um, it's because I have Jesus in my life. He's like, oh, man, you're going to do the whole religious thing on me? I was like, no, man, don't even call it religion. You can if you want to, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about Jesus. I believe that the Son of God came in the form of a man. He lived a perfect life, uh, died on the cross for our sins. He rose from the grave three days later and ascended into heaven. And if we have faith in that, he did that for us, then, then we go to heaven when we die. I said, you, you, you asked why I don't get upset about things. 
it's because I know I'm going to heaven. It's like, yeah, I just lost in a game because I got headshot. And I'm still going to heaven. <laughs> Some guy called me a homophobic term because I didn't get him a soda or something. Still going to heaven doesn't change that. And so like, I'm not really worried about those small things because in the much bigger grand scheme of things, I get to be in heaven with the God who created me and loves me forever. I'm not worried about that stuff. Why should I be? And these words stuck out to him a great deal. Richard was uh, perplexed, interested by all of this and wanted to know more. He's like, so wait, wait. So, so who is this Jesus guy? Okay, let, let, me, let me tell you about him. So over the course of about four days, like two or three hours a night, I was typing back and forth with my friend. This time he had moved to Chico. Um, he's still there now. And uh, we were just typing back and forth. I'm telling him all about religion and faith. And I shouldn't even say religion. I'm telling him about my faith and, and how I know Jesus as my Savior. He's very interested. But he's worried because it's a change. His parents were, I guess, traditional Buddhists. Um, he didn't really want to call himself Christian. So finally he says, hey, man, I, I want to have faith. I want to believe all that stuff you're saying. But I don't, I don't think I can call myself a Christian. I, 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 I don't like most Christians I've met. <laughs> like, yeah, I know what you mean. I don't like him either. Um, you don't have to call yourself a Christian, dude. You can call yourself whatever you want. All that matters is you know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he died on the cross for your sins. Faith in that alone means you go to heaven. He's like, yeah, yeah, I want that. I want, I want that. Do I, need to, do I need to say a prayer? Do I have to go get baptized first? What, 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 do, I do, what do I do now? I say, you don't have to do anything. That, that, that's the coolest part of it. Every religion says do something to make your way to God. But in this faith, it's already been done for you. Completely done. If you have faith in the things we just talked about, you're going to heaven. You can pray about it, sure. You can, you can solidify it by telling God, by praying to him, like, God, I believe this. But you don't need to get baptized. You, you should get baptized at some point, sure. That's not, that's not going to save you. Your faith alone and what Jesus did, his sacrifice, is what saves you. He's like, I have that. Dude, that's awesome. He starts typing really fast. He's like, I'm freaking crying right now. I'm like, me too. He's typing back. I just led my friend to Christ over the internet because I said please and thank you and offered people sodas. Did you hear that? I said please and thank you and offered people sodas and snacks on a regular basis, and it gave me the chance to lead someone to Jesus. Man. That's my favorite story I think I ever get to tell. I don't get to brag about a lot of things. I don't like to be prideful at all, but I have pride in probably that story alone, that I had a chance to share my faith with somebody. Now, as a pastor, I've got a chance to share my faith with a lot of people. I've been on stage and shared to a lot of students and whatnot, but never ever have I ever had a chance like that where someone's asked me about my faith just because of the way I live my life, because of my language, because I'm trying to be kind to people. I'm very, very proud of that moment. That was a lot of fun for me. Richard is in Chico now um, doing youth ministry, <laughs> of all things. Um, I, I still keep up with him on Facebook. Yeah, he's doing really well. He's a very good friend of mine, and we catch up uh, quite often. He's a good dude. And uh, he's, uh, he, he's living a good life and hopefully sharing Jesus with people up there now, too. So this whole analogy, like the verses we talked about, is being a light before men. Now, my light shined before Richard, and he saw it, and it was appealing to him, and he wanted to know more about it, and I had a chance to, to share Jesus with him. So I want you to think about this question right now. If you follow Jesus on any level, then you have a light. My question is, what kind of light are you? How do people see Jesus through you? I'm going to use some analogies here in a minute, and uh, I'd like you to think about that question. If you were a light for Jesus, what kind of light would you be? I've got a couple examples. Let's start with this one right here. This is the big floodlight. Or I better yet, it's called a work light. It's pretty bright. I love these things. Uh, I use these things, let's light up the drum set. It's like a glorious drum set. It's kind of neat. But uh, I use these things all the time. Like I, I work outside, um, like, like when I lost Levi in the dark. When I do woodworking and building and that kind of stuff, I like to do so at night. I am a total nocturnal being. Uh, I'm not a morning person at all. If you were here a couple weeks ago, you heard me talk about that. This is a, a caffeine-induced sermon right now. This is not me normally. Um, I like to do stuff at night. And at night... I'll set one of these bad boys up, and I can work. I can, I can do all the woodworking I want, whatever kind of stuff I want to do. Um, as long as you're paying your power bill, it never dies. It's plugged in. I've never had to change a bulb on one of these things. I don't know if any other guys have had to deal with that, but these things seem like they last forever. It's just awesome. These are fantastic lights. The only thing they don't have going for them is they're not very mobile. They're kind of big and clunky. They're hard to carry around. They have to be plugged in. They're meant to be stationary. For me, this light reminds me a lot of a church, a lot like this church. It is supposed to be stationary and a beacon of hope. I was joking with the students when I shared this with them. I said, if you, if you look around the edges of the bottom of this church, there's no wheels. This church can't move. Of course, instead, it needs people 
that, that can move. It needs people who can go share that light with, with other people. Because people have wheels or, or legs. Or they have cars with wheels, whatever. They can move, but the church can't. This church is stationary. Now, I think this is a good church that is a beacon of hope. This is a, a light for people who are lost. Who, people who are looking for Jesus. And they need light to help them find him. We'll see the rock church and say, I'm going to go in there and find out. I, I know this church is a light because I've seen, I've seen Pastor Art stand up here and tell people about Jesus. I'm telling you about Jesus right now. I've seen people walk in the office doors with, with, with hurt and pain in their life looking for help. So yeah, this church is a fantastic light. Absolutely. But one of the biggest problems it has is that it, it can't move. It stays right here. But better yet, let's be a little more literal because when I say the church, most of us think of the church building. But if we read the Bible carefully, we'll find the church is not in the building. The church is where? It's in the people. We are the church. And like I said, we do have wheels. We can move. So I'm guessing none of you would say you're this kind of light. As a whole, we can be this kind of light. But instead, there are other kinds of lights I think we can be instead. I said instead twice there. It's redundant. The first light that's, that's mobile I want to talk about, this one. Almost everybody's got one of these lights with them. Or better yet, let me think, find my app on here. This is like the emergency last effort, like last ditch resort light, right? Like when you can't find a flashlight, you've got your cell phone light. Everybody, almost everybody's got one of these things. And what's the most common use for a cell phone light? At the movies when you've lost your keys. Are you with me? It's funny, I was telling students this Wednesday, went to the movies with some students on Thursday, and it happened. The people next to us all sitting here, ching, when they, when they stand up, oh no, they get their light out and look for it. This happens all the time. This is the most primary use for a cell phone light. I think that's the whole reason they created these apps. Or better yet, do you remember before we had smartphones, when you would get your phone out and you'd have to use the light of your phone trying to find things? This is so inefficient. This is like the worst case scenario. Like if you're looking for your keys because you dropped them in the movies, that doesn't really help much. This is, the whole, like, this is the whole thing you're trying to get away with, and it's really not that helpful at all. But it's better than nothing, right? Like if, you, if you're looking for something, if you drop your keys, you are thankful you have a crappy little cell phone light. It's, it's, it's better than, than just looking in the dark, just randomly feeling around the nasty movie floor. So you're, you're thankful to have that light. The batteries don't last. If you use the, the flashlight function on your phone, it eats the battery in like, what, 10 minutes? Your whole phone's dead. It does not last very long. It's not very bright. It is not the best option by any means. If there's a flashlight next to you and you had the option, you'd take it. When I lost my, my son in the dark, I had my cell phone with me. I went in the house and got a flashlight instead because it's a better option. Now, I think a lot of believers look like this. I know I have in my life. There are times in my life where I have been not the best option to share Jesus with somebody, but I was the only option. I've had chances where I see the door open where I have a chance to share Jesus with somebody, be it a student, an adult, or somebody who wants to know about Jesus, and I'll do this. Someone, someone want, want to talk to this guy about Jesus? Uh, is there a missionary or uh, an evangelist in, in the room? That can, is Francis Chan here? Can someone tell him about Jesus for me? No? It's me? Okay. And so I do so, and, and, and I may not be the most qualified or best person at the time to do so, but nonetheless, uh, this is my chance to share Jesus with somebody. Now, I want to be careful with this because by no means do I want you to feel ill-qualified to share your faith. Because while a cell phone may not be the best option, sometimes it's all you need. I don't know how many times I've used my cell phone to find things in the movie theater, and it, it works. It may not be the brightest, best, most prepared option, but it, but it works. It gets the job done. Now, my good friend always likes to say that God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. I love that statement. Because at some point in your life, God, God, God may open a door, maybe he already has, for, to somebody and say, I want you to share your faith with that person. You may be thinking, I'm not qualified. I am not a big floodlight. I'm barely the, the screen on a smartphone that's halfway dying, right? I don't know what to say. Tell them who Jesus is to you. Tell them what Jesus has done for you. You don't have to have all the answers. I, 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 when I talked to Richard, he started asking me some crazy questions. Well, if Jesus is real, how come dinosaurs and how come this? And I don't know. I'd type back. But I know this. He died for my sins. If I have faith in that, I go to heaven. As long as, you, as long as you know that, as long as you know that Jesus is the Son of God and died for your sins, you have a light. And that's probably, actually, I, I know that it is enough if God gives you the opportunity to share that faith. Now, the next light is interesting. It might be a little bit alarming to you. Isn't that annoying? 
Like half of you probably hate me right now. I apologize for doing that. This is a video light. I do a lot of photography, a little bit of videography too. And this sucker goes on top of a video camera. And so that way you, you can video well in light. I won't do it again. I'm sorry. Um, the problem with that is if it's dark out and, and, and you're video peeping, video, videoing people, uh, often they give you this reaction. They don't want to be on camera because they can't see anything. The light's so overwhelming, so overbearing, it's annoying, and it's not useful at all. Now, if I was looking for something or you were looking for something, I just blinded you like that. It's not helping you find anything. Some of you probably have that spot. When you, when you blink right now, you keep blinking, you see that spot? Yeah, that's because of the light. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's not helpful at all. Unfortunately, I have met some believers, I've probably even been guilty of this myself, that are so overbearing, they're so loud, they only want to talk about their faith, and Jesus, 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 read your Bible, I went to church, there's healing at my church, and that's all they ever talk about. They're so overwhelming that you, you, you can't even cut through all that to figure out what they're trying to say, or that they're so bright and so in your face about it, that it's like, man, calm down. I met quite a few believers like that, and like I said, I, I've been guilty of that at times as well. Where all I want to do is tell everybody about Jesus, and, and my heart's in the right place. Some of these people, they have hearts in the right place where they want people to know who Jesus is. But if we're not relatable, if we're not personable, if we don't show people that we care about them, they're going to have a much harder time understanding what we're talking about. They're not really going to want to hear from us. If we come on so strong, like, like this kind of a light, where, yes, it's technically a light. Yes, technically it can help you find things. But when it's in your face and so bright, it's more annoying and, and kind of in the way that it is useful. I think a lot of believers can come across like that sometimes. I know I've done it myself multiple times. I have to get myself in check sometimes. And what I love about this light, I won't blind you, I promise, is that although it can be horrible like this, you can turn it down. Not too bad, right? You can use that, and that can help you find stuff. That can be a beacon for Jesus. That, like, if I was looking for something, that would actually help me find things. So while our hearts can be in the right place, sometimes we can easily become too overbearing You guys hear that? I apologize in advance. <laughs> this is a camera flash. Uh, I have a, a DSLR, and um, I love doing photography. That's the flash for it. It is uh, probably the worst example. I won't do it anymore. Sorry, I won't, I won't blind you guys. I promise I was the last one. Um, <laughs> you know, believe me. That, that's probably the worst and most annoying one for me, because if you're looking for something, would this help at all? No, it's not consistent. If I can make that thing stay on, maybe it would help a little bit then, but it only flashes real quick, and it does so so brightly and so annoying that, that you, again, you probably have like that spot when you blink now where you can't see anything, and, or if you're looking directly at me, wherever you're looking now has that spot, and you can't, like, if you're looking at my face right now, it's just a big white bulb, right? <laughs> that drives me nuts. Unfortunately, some believers look like this as well where their light is so bright and so, frankly, offensive that it hurts people. And it's not consistent, and it only comes on at a very specific, brief time. And usually it's to judge. Now, I know very few believers, um, these are probably the ones you see on the news, that they only want to talk about their faith when it's in context of judging other people. It reminds me of Westboro Baptist Church. I don't, I don't like to poke fun or make fun of any church, but I don't believe this to really be a church or a Bible-believing people. If you're familiar with them at all, they're a very small group of people that um, get together and they protest soldiers' funerals. They protest, like they try to do the most offensive thing they possibly can to get people's attention. They hold up picket signs that say things like, uh, God hates, um, like a homophobic slur. Really ugly words they'll use. Um, they try to say that, um, that our men and women in uniform are dying because, because America is accepting homosexuality or something like that. Just crazy stuff that's not in the Bible. That's not helping people know Jesus. Instead, it's just judging people and hurting them and leaving them m more offended than helped, which is where they don't want to go near the light ever again. Amen. If your only inclination, if your only real experience with Christianity, note the quotes, if you can see me, quotes over here. Um, if your only experience with Christianity is Westboro Baptist Church, or believers that do that kind of thing like the Flash, where they, just, they only want to talk about their faith when they're going to jump in your face and judge you for something you're doing. If that's your only experience, the next time you see that kind of light, you might just back away slowly. That makes me so very sad. That some people, unfortunately, are trying, I assume they're trying to do what they think is the right thing, but they're doing so in such an abrasive, aggressive, mean, distorted way that it's just hurting people. Amen. It's not helping them find Jesus. That's not the kind of believer I want to be, nor the kind of believer I want to be around. Now, I've got an interesting kind of light for you. I won't blind you, I promise. If you see this, 
Can you barely see that thing? That's, that's dull, right? You know why that's so dull? There's no batteries. It doesn't plug in. Wind-up light. Makes a funny sound. Kind of cute, right? I hate these things. They drive me nuts. They seem like such a good idea. Oh, cool. Never have to buy batteries again. I keep one in my truck. Thought it was so cool. I'm going to take it hiking and camping. And then all of a sudden I need to use it. And it's like, really? Hang on. There it goes. Oh, it's dull again. There it goes. This is useless. Try to change a tire or something with this. Try to like, if, like, if you're camping, you're trying to go hiking, walking around like this. It's the worst idea ever. This thing is rid ridiculous. I hate wind-up lights. But the cool thing about them, if you can call it that, is that they don't need batteries. They don't need to plug in. They are self-sufficient. They don't need an external power source. They don't need to be plugged in regularly. They don't need to be filled up. Get the analogy? There are some believers that don't think they need to be a part of a church body. Some believers would say, I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. He died for my sins. But I don't like organized religion. That's become a much more common uh, belief system or stance lately. A lot of people would say that. I believe in Jesus. I believe in God. But I don't like organized religion. I've heard a lot of people say that kind of stuff. And it kind of hurts me a little bit because they're looking at this as organized religion. I like this. If they're going to say they don't like it, I'm a little bit offended. But uh, the idea is that they've seen larger organizational structures. I don't want to use specific names, but like large organizations of, be it um, a denomination or something like that, they've seen large organizational structures of faith do some things that they're kind of ugly. One thing I hate about Westboro Baptist Church is they use the word church and Baptist. Those are good words, I think. But unfortunately, people start to get a negative connotation about them when they, when they hear them. And so some people don't want anything to do with the church. They want to be self-sufficient, like this wind-up light. They think that they can have a light all of their own, and they can go out and, and share this light with people, although they're not plugged into a healthy church body. The problem with that is, just like this light, they're never going to be as bright or as helpful as they think they are. They're going to be dull and not as bright. I've got one more verse, verse for you real quick. Can you put that one up there for me? It says, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is one of many verses that makes it clear that we are called to be a part of a larger body. We are called to be a part of a church that helps us grow, that helps us work together to be a light before men. My favorite verse is Proverbs 27, 17. I've talked about it before. It says, as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. And we cannot be sharp. We cannot be bright unless we have some sort of, even if it's a loosely organized structure, so that we can help each other grow in Christ. The Bible talks about an organized structure. You just, all throughout the New Testament, they have these early churches. All of the epistles, those are all the books that are written to specific churches, like um, Philippians and, and Romans and all, all these books. There are Ephesians, Galatians. These are all written to the church in that city. That's what the epistles mean, is, there, is Paul's writing a church and telling them about how they ought to structure and organize things and how he can encourage them and help them. Those are organized religions or organized churches. It might be loosely organized, but this is the example we have. Acts talks about the very first churches, and it's awesome. Yes, there's some organizational structure, and it's important to have that so that we can figure out ways we can meet together. I've not yet met somebody who would not be plugged into a church, say they believe in Jesus and God and have faith and have a light, but not be plugged into a church, and then go out and be effective with their faith and share it with people. Did you hear me on that? I've not yet met someone who, who says, I'm not going to be a part of, part of organized religion, but I'm going to go out and share my faith effectively. I've met people who think that's what they're doing, and I've even seen some of them try to share their faith. It doesn't go so well. They look a lot like this dull light, where they're like, oh, so you want to know about Jesus? Yeah, um, he's cool. Um, you, should, uh, you, should, you should read this Bible. It'll tell you more about him. It's really usually all they got. Because if we're not plugged into a body like this, we're going we're gonna to lose our light very quickly. We're going to need to be wound up or plugged in or charged somehow. Well, I've got a couple more lights for you. I'm almost done, I promise. We'll do two more. we got this one right here. This is technically a flashlight. It's dull, right? Like if you had a flashlight, this is not the first one you'd pick. This is not very bright at all. This is only dull for one reason. That's because the batteries are getting low. Uh, it's running out of juice. And this is the same kind of thing I want to talk about when it comes to the wind-up light, is that if we're not getting plugged in regularly, if we're not getting charged up by being a part of a church body, we're going to easily lose our charge and not be as effective for Jesus as we would like to be. 
That's not where I want to be. When you come across a flashlight that's fully charged, or, or worse yet, a flashlight like this, I've got like a million. You guys have these at home? I get them for Christmas every year, like 13 of these for Christmas every year. These little lights, they, they die pretty quick. I, I brought this one with the intent of using it and later on found out, oh, it's dead. But it makes a good analogy because if a believer is not plugged into a home church, not getting recharged regularly, it can be very, very difficult to share your faith. I've been in that situation. I've been, I had times in my life where I've not been very plugged into a church. I've not been uh, very, very healthy being a part of a church body. And people ask me about my faith, and I'm dull. Uh, yeah, um, you should talk to my pastor, is often the response I would give, or the, often the, the response that I hear from people. And that's their idea. Uh, yeah, come to church with me and talk to my youth pastor or my pastor at that church. That's not ideal. See, most often, people would rather hear about Jesus from someone close to them that they know and trust than somebody who works for the church like me. Do you hear me on that? I had students before that I, I would pound this into their heads. They, they would know it. They could recite it right away. So the best person to tell your friends about Jesus is you. A lot of people have this idea like, yeah, I'm going to go bring everyone to church. Yes, bring people to this church. Fantastic. But when they want to know more about spirituality or faith or Jesus or the Bible or God or theology, when they want to know about those things, they would much rather hear it from you than from me because they know you. They trust you. They don't know me. They don't know how qualified I am for what I'm saying makes sense. I've heard it said, I love this, this quote, it says, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Amen. Love that quote. Amen. I had a pastor in California that said that every Sunday. And I believe it to be true. And so the people that you care for, that see that you care for them, they will listen to you. They want you to be that light in their life. Like I said, everybody's looking for Jesus. Some of them just don't know it yet. I've only got one more kind of light here. It's my favorite. Now, kind of an unorthodox way to light stuff up, right? Most of the time you would choose a flashlight or something, but this light can do some things that none of the other lights can do. First of all, let me ask you this. How long is this going to burn for just like this? 20 minutes, 10 minutes, half hour? Not really sure. Not very long. Not until the end of the day. But what if I tend to it? What if I care for it and help it grow? What if, what, what if I, I feed some more fuel to this thing? I mean, I, I can even light something else up, like a campfire or a torch or a lantern. How long can I keep this burning for? Probably indefinitely. It's not hard to keep. The Olympic torch has been going for like a couple hundred years or something. I don't know. But yeah, you can keep one flame going for as long as you want to, as long as you care for it, as long as you tend to it. If I were to care for it and I were to tend to it, how bright could I make this flame? Very bright. Look at the sun for a minute. The sun is just a flame. It's just gas is burning. I was a firefighter for a while, and I saw some flames that were extremely bright. They would hurt your eyes. Some of them were extremely crazy, cool-looking colors, really neat to watch. I think this is the kind of light Jesus was talking about for a couple of reasons. One, because he didn't have any flashlights. So probably was talking about torches or some form of fire when he talked about light. But for another very good reason, this is my favorite reason of all. None of the other flashlights can do this. You can share your light. I guess this is my favorite part about this. Is when this is the kind of light you have, you can pass it on. And you see how, much, how dull this one got because I took something away from it? No. Didn't take anything away from it. One of the analogies I love about this is that you can share your light as many times as you want to, and your light will become no less bright. You will have lost nothing. Instead, you will have only gained You'll have friends and family in heaven who can meet you there. The only one thing that really lasts in this world, or not in this world, and it, overall, the one thing that lasts is relationships. Be them with, with God or Jesus or with others that will meet us in heaven. Those are the only things that are going to last. I want to be this kind of light. I want to be the kind of light that, like a faith muscle, if cared for, if tended to, can grow. Become as bright as you want it to be. Wednesday night, we, we used this light to go light a campfire at the end of the night. And students came around and, and ate s'mores and, and just sat around the campfire and talked. I love campfires. I talk about them a lot. And there's just something about that kind of light. When you see a campfire, 
You're attracted to it. You want to go sit down because they probably have s'mores and they're really good. But also you can sit down and talk with people and, and sing songs. And I've, I've never had a bad experience at a campfire. Like, man, I don't want to go back there. I love campfires. That's the kind of light we created Wednesday night. What kind of light do you want to be? Now, I don't care if you use one of my analogies or one of your own, or you just think, man, I want to be a flame. I want to be on fire for God. It's a Ren Collective song. It says, uh, set your church on fire. doesn't mean literally, of course. But it means people of God with a light inside of them that's so bright that the whole church just shines and people can't help but to notice and want to be a part of it. I want to be that kind of church. I hope you do too. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this time. I thank you for a chance to stand up here and uh, talk to these people about you and uh, the light that you set inside of us, God. God, I want to be a bright light for you. Not overwhelming, overbearing, or, or weird, but like a candle, God, I want to burn for you. I want to help other people burn for you. I mean, thank you so much for my friend Richard, who saw a light in me all those years ago and wants to know more about it. I pray for more opportunities like that. I pray that the people in this room would have opportunities like that, that their friends and family would see a light burning in them, and they would want to know more about it, and they could share that light. They could share that flame, God. Help us to burn brightly for you. And for those around us, we love you, Father. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Nick.